Hey, are you wondering what is the timeline panel in Adobe Premiere Pro? Do you want to know how to use it efficiently? You will spend most of your time in that panel as you are building up your project. Watch this tutorial. I'll cover all the important aspects of the timeline panel and I'll also share some helpful tips. <music> In this tutorial, I'm covering the timeline panel, which is a core component in Premiere. That's where clips get assembled and edited. Some of the key takeaways from watching this tutorial include learning and using shortcuts to improve your editing workflow, learning about tracks and configure tracks to ease up editing, learning those options that can be used to generate different flavors of the final project and this with minimal changes to the source project, and understanding markers and how markers can be used to add visual references at specific points within the project. By the end of this course, you will have the tools and techniques needed to work efficiently within the timeline. I am Benoit Farin for benexplorer.com. If this course sounds like what you are looking for and you don't mind about my French accent, then click the subscribe button so you do not miss on future tips and tutorials. And if you are already a subscriber, click the little bell icon to get notified of future videos. Let's jump into it. We will cover several areas in the timeline. The tracks that you can see here, this is where clips are assembled. Those little icons here are used to control your tracks. We will cover this soon, but first, I would like to share a few useful tips about shortcuts. We first need to give focus to the timeline panel. Click here. You can see that the panel now has focus. Notice the blue highlight. I would like more space to work with here, so I'll increase the size of the timeline panel. Just place your cursor here click and drag up. This expands the timeline panel. Working with the panel is now easier. All right, what about those timeline shortcuts then? Use the up key and the down key. They are extremely useful when navigating the timeline. When I hit the up key, the current time indicator jumps to the previous edit point, And when I hit the down key, it jumps to the next edit point in the sequence. An edit point marks the start or the end of a clip. Up and down keys are a convenient way to jump through the edit points on a sequence. And well, what about the home key? Hit home and voila! The time indicator jumps to the very beginning of the sequence. Easy enough, but so useful. Shall we now bet on the end key? You win! Hit end and the cursor jumps to the very end of the sequence. What about zoom in and zoom out shortcuts? First, let's position the playhead here. And now assume you want more precision control around this area. One option is to use the zoom tool. To access the zoom tool, long press the pan tool and the zoom tool shows up here. Don't select the tool, hit escape. We are talking about shortcuts here. The zoom in shortcut is the equal sign on your keyboard. Notice that as I hit the equal sign, and hit it again, the zoom is centered to the current time indicator. And now to zoom out, hit the minus key. Notice that the current time indicator remains at the center of the timeline. Equal to zoom in and minus to zoom out. Along with the zoom in and zoom out shortcuts, the backslash key on the keyboard can be used to quickly fit the sequence to the size of the window. See, I hit backslash, and the sequence now fits the size of the timeline window. Hit the equal sign a few times to zoom in. Notice that the sequence doesn't fit the window. Now, when I hit backslash, the sequence is zoomed out to fit. The same is true when we zoom out. Hit the minus key a few times to zoom out. See, our sequence is now compressed in this area. Now hit backslash, and the sequence is zoomed in to fit. This is much easier than trying to resize using the slider here. Depending on the complexity of the timeline and the number of tracks, this can become quite tedious. Just use backslash. An additional quick tip. 
If you hit backslash again, the timeline is set back to the previous zoom level. Hit backslash to fit, hit backslash to get back to the previous zoom level. Write those shortcuts down, keep them close by, and use them. They'll speed up your editing process. OK, now let's move on to tracks. As I said earlier, tracks represent the area where you are dropping and assembling clips. To add a clip from the project panel, you would drag a video clip to video track 1, for instance, or an audio clip to one of the audio tracks. I already added a few video clips and an audio clip to video track 1 and to audio track 1. We can increase the track height to better analyze the audio channels, for instance, or to get more information about the video clips. So I'll show you how to do that. We can use several ways to adjust the height of a track. One option is to hit the plus key, shift and the equal sign on the keyboard. See when I hit plus, all tracks expand. And with the underscore key, hit shift and the minus sign on your keyboard, all tracks collapse. Plus expands the tracks, underscore collapses them. You can also use this line to customize the height of any particular track. Click this line and drag it up, say to here, and release the mouse. You can drag it further up or down to define a height that meets your needs. Notice that as we moved this line, we defined the height of a single track, this track. What if you want to resize the height of all tracks? This can be done in a single step. Hold Shift and then click any line and drag it up or down. Release the mouse and notice that the height of all tracks is adjusted. By holding Shift and moving this line, we adjusted this track line here yet all the track's height have been adjusted. The height of our tracks is now quite disorganized. I'll share a tip on how to reset them to default size. But first, note that the way we resized the video tracks applies to audio tracks as well. Click on this line, drag and release the mouse, you just change the size of the audio track 1. Hold Shift, click the line, drag and release the mouse, we change the height of all the audio tracks. A bonus tip before we move on. Position your mouse here on the video track 1 area, hold Alt or Option on the Mac, and scroll the wheel of your mouse one way or the other. Video track 1 resizes. Cool tip, right? You can do this to any video tracks, V2, V3, or the audio tracks. Now hold Shift instead and scroll the wheel of your mouse. That resizes the height of all your tracks, either the video tracks or the audio tracks. Now that we resized the height of all these tracks on the timeline panel, you probably want to reset their height. Sure, we could hold Shift, click on the line and try to resize it. This might work, but as you can see, I would probably have to do this a few times till I'm happy with the results and get back to the default values. I can also just hit the underscore key, but hey, they are too narrow now, or the plus key, but they are too wide. I just want to get back to the original height, so there must be a way, right? And there is a way indeed. Place the cursor here, hold shift and double click. Doing so toggles between the last height you've customized and the default height, see? I hold shift, double click, and now double click again. The same applies to the audio tracks, so let's reset those tracks to their default value. Here we go. Good. Okay, now let's make sure that the height of the V1 track is sufficiently large to show thumbnails. I will use the wheel trick to do this, so I hit Alt or Option on the Mac, and now I'm scrolling the wheel of the mouse and make sure that the sequence is zoomed to fit to the size of the window, hit backslash if it does not. Notice that the clips here are displaying thumbnails and the name of the clip. We are currently showing two thumbnails, the head and the tail video thumbnails, as we can see here for the first clip and here for the last clip. The second clip is too short, so only one thumbnail is shown. 
we can change this behavior from the timeline menu. Hit this icon, it looks like a hamburger, doesn't it? And open the timeline menu. You can see that the setting for displaying thumbnails is currently set to show both the head and the tail thumbnail. I can change this to head only. Notice the change on the timeline. Only one thumbnail is now displayed. Go back to the menu and now select continuous video thumbnails. Now check the timeline and let's zoom here. To zoom in using the shortcut, remember, click the equal sign button. And notice that we see thumbnails throughout the clip. This can be useful when you are looking for a certain area of your clip. But this makes the timeline too busy for me. So I'll set it back to display two thumbnails. Open the menu, select video head and tail thumbnails. And finally, hit backslash so the sequence is zoomed to fit to the size of the window. Now, the clip thumbnails that we see here on the timeline or the clip names can be hidden altogether. We will now look at additional timeline options. Most of those may not seem to be important now, but remember, our project is fairly simple. As the complexity of the project increases, you will want to benefit from these options and simplify this view. I'm showing them to you now, so you know they exist. And I will be quick, don't worry. Options are accessible from the Timeline Display Settings menu. To open this menu, click the wrench icon. To turn off thumbnails on the timeline, look for Show Video Thumbnails and deselect it. As you'd expect, thumbnails are now off. You can also turn clip names off. Just open the Display Settings menu and disable Show Video Name. The timeline is far less busy now, but I do find both thumbnails and clip names helpful as they help recognize clips on the timeline. So let's set them both back to on. Back to the menu, select Show Video Thumbnails, and back to the menu again, pick Show Video Names. Open the menu again. We will look at keyframes in details when we are covering effects in a future tutorial. For now, note that when you turn this option on, keyframes would then appear on the clips in the timeline. If I select Show Video Keyframes now, a horizontal line appears here and keyframes would display along this line. Back to the menu, let's go down here and we see two options. Minimize all tracks and expand all tracks. This is yet another way to change the height of our tracks. Select Minimize and the height for each track is set to its minimum height. Now back to the menu and select Expand all tracks and each track is expanded to a preset value. Note that these options affect both the video and the audio tracks. At this point, we know that we can easily reset the height of our tracks, remember? To reset the height of the track to their default value, hit Shift and double-click one of the video tracks and do the same on an audio track. Remember that Shift double-click toggles between default height and expanded tracks, so I'll make sure to set the height to the default value. Here we go. All right, we played with track heights, with thumbnails, and the way thumbnails are displayed on the track, and with clip names. We will go beyond tracks very soon in this tutorial and cover markers as a way to set notes to self. But let's look a little more on tracks. I'll show you how to add and delete tracks on the timeline. Notice that some of these tracks are empty. The video 2 and video 3 tracks are empty. The A2 and A3 are empty as well. Premiere creates several tracks to simplify our work, as we most probably will want to use multiple tracks anyway during editing. But let's assume for a moment that we do not need these empty tracks. To delete a specific track, right-click or command-click over this empty space, the track context menu shows up, and select Delete Track. The track has been deleted. Good. Let's undo this action, select Edit Undo. OK, we now know how to remove one track. Note that the same operation would work for audio tracks. I would right-click or command-click here, and I would just select Delete Track to remove this audio track. Same behavior, then I just hit Cancel. We might want to delete multiple tracks. 
So one way to do that is right click on each track one by one and select the delete track option from the menu. Although that would certainly work, there is a more efficient method for removing several empty tracks at once. Right click or command click near any track and we won't select delete track this time but select delete tracks instead. What I want is remove all the video tracks that are empty, so basically V2 and V3. So I'll tick the delete video tracks and I'll make sure that all empty tracks is selected in the list here. By the way, notice that I could also delete a specific track from here. If I select video 1, then the V1 track here would be deleted. So let's choose all empty tracks. I also want to remove all the empty audio tracks. The A2 and A3 tracks here are empty. So I'll hit this check mark and ensure to select all empty tracks from the list. Now, after I click OK and execute the action, notice that the V2, V3 and A2, A3 tracks have been removed. The timeline only contains tracks that aren't empty. Let's have a little more fun with tracks. We are almost done, I promise. We will now add new tracks to our timeline. Adding a track can be done manually or automatically. To add a track manually, right click or common click on this empty space on video track 1 and select Add Track. Notice it creates video track 2. Now, if I do this again and right click or common click on this empty space on video track 1, and select Add Track, a new track is added between Video Track 1 and Video Track 2. Video Track 2 was actually renamed to Video Track 3. To demonstrate that, I'll move bankers and a car to Video Track 2. And once again, I will right click or common click here on Video Track 1. And as I select Add Track, notice that an empty track is created between Track 1 and track 2. That is the new track we just created and track 2, which contains our clip, has now been renamed track 3. The same applies to audio tracks. When I right click or common click on this empty space on audio track 1, a new audio track is created. The process for manually adding audio tracks is the same as adding video tracks. We looked at adding tracks manually and I said that tracks can be created automatically. This process is very simple, but let's clear things up a bit. I move this clip back to the V1 video track and I want to delete the empty tracks. So right click any track here, select delete tracks, enable delete video tracks and delete audio tracks and ensure that all empty tracks is selected for both and finally hit OK. Let's now create a new track automatically. Expand the video folder in the project panel and click and drag the clip mountain bike in the forest and drop it here above the V1 track. Notice that the V2 track has been created for us. So in order to add clips on a new track on the timeline, we do not have to create a new track. A new track can be created for us just by dropping a clip like we did here. Notice that this clip has a soundtrack, so a new soundtrack was also created for us. By the way, a new track can also be created by moving a clip to a non-existing track. Drag bikes on street to the very top here. See? Premiere creates another track for us. This works the same way for audio. Drag this audio channel down here, a new audio track is created. Notice though that the master audio track is a special track and always remains at the bottom of the audio tracks. We will look at the master audio track in a later tutorial as we cover audio. Ok, enough already with tracks. Let's move on to something else. Let's look at some of these icons here. They define whether or not a track is displayed in the program monitor panel and whether or not to display a track in the final output of our project. But first, let's clean things up. We made changes to our project. Navigate to the File menu and select Revert. 
just hit yes to discard the changes we made. We won't need them in this tutorial. File revert reverts the project to the version that was last saved on disk. Now let's look at some of the items that show up here. This icon that looks like an eye is a toggle to turn the output of a video track off or on. You might want to turn off a video track when you do not want the clips on the track to show on the program monitor panel or when you do not want a particular track to show in the final output of the project. Let's use an example. Click the text tool and add some text here type benexplorer.com. This might be our logo, for example. The text shows on the V2 track and displays on top of our video clips on V1. We are using text, but this could be anything, another clip or an image. Expand the text throughout the sequence, like so. This is our logo. We want to see it throughout the movie. And let's position the text down here. Now, as we play the sequence, the text shows up here as expected. You might want two versions of the final output, one with the logo displayed and another version without the logo displayed. So I can do this by simply toggling this option. I can build two versions of the final output without having to alter my project or remove anything from this track. This switch lets me choose what to display in the output window without changing my project. Very useful. OK, let's move on. Just remove the text as we won't need it for now. Click on the clip and hit delete. That toggle is also useful when working on a clip that is covered by another clip. Let's go through this quickly. Select bikers and a car from video track 1. Drag it to V2 and place it somewhere on top of Road Trail Biker. Premiere renders clips in a certain order. It displays V1, then V2, V3, etc. So a clip on V2 will cover the clips beneath it. So when I scrub here, notice that the clip that we see is Bikers and a Car, and it covers this portion of the clip below. But how can I access this piece of the clip on V1? I might want to access and see the content of this clip here. I could delete the clip here on V2, but that wouldn't be smart, right? Toggle track output is here to help. Turn off video track 2 and the portion of the clip is now visible. Good. Moving on to the M and the S icons here, but first let's undo what we just did. Set toggle track output back to on for the second track and move this clip back to its original location on V1. The icon represented by an M is used to mute or to unmute an audio track. So when I mute A1, the audio 1 track is silent. And assuming we had audio clips here on either A2 or A3, then those would play except A1. You might run into a scenario where A1 plays a background music, a2, A3, A4 each contains the voiceovers in different languages, for instance. In that case, I could keep A1 to play the background music and mute any audio tracks except one, the English voiceover, for example, render the output in English, then mute the English voiceover and unmute French and do that for each language. Similarly to the toggle track output option, I can use the mute option to generate distinct versions of my work without having to change the layout of my project. The solo button represented by an S here mutes all audio tracks except the soloed track. So if we had multiple song tracks and I want to analyze this audio track, say A1, I could either mute each track here by hitting M for A2 and A3 in this case, only A1 would play. But instead of muting all the tracks that I do not want to play, I can solo A1, and A1 is the only audio channel that's going to play. This is fairly simple, but extremely useful when your project contains multiple audio tracks. The lock button is straightforward. See the little lock here? 
This locks a track and prevents any changes to it. To lock the video 1 track, hit the little lock icon and to lock the audio track A1, click here. Notice that the locked tracks are hashed. Premiere is telling us that these tracks are protected. The mute button, the solo button and the toggle track output button are all inaccessible now. A locked track still plays on the program monitor and is rendered to the final output, but the track is protected from any changes. Let's try to move a video clip. See, I just can't do that. Now drag a new video clip from the project panel, expand the video bin and drag mountain bike in the forest to V1. See, I cannot add a clip to this track either because it is locked. It is protected from any changes. This is very useful when a project contains many, many tracks. You will want to lock some tracks in order to prevent unwanted changes. All right, enough of tracks. I said we'd look at markers. Let's talk about markers then. But first, we should revert our changes and start fresh. So navigate to File, select Revert, and click Yes to discard the changes we just made. There are two types of markers, clip markers and sequence markers. Let's start with clip markers. Most of the times, a clip marker is used to add notes to self on a clip on the timeline. We might want to add an effect to this clip, a blur effect, for example. For some reason, we don't want to do that now, perhaps because we are busy assembling clips on the timeline. So we can use a marker in order to remember to do this later. So let's add a marker to this clip. First, make sure that Show Clip Markers is enabled. To do that, open the Timeline Display Settings menu by hitting this little wrench icon. And in the list, make sure that Show Clip Markers is enabled. Then select the clip you want the marker to be placed on and assume that you want to review this area at a later time. We will add a marker as a reminder. We can either click this icon here, it looks like an arrow pointing down, or simply hit M on the keyboard. Do not move the cursor, hit M again. The marker window opens and we can define our marker here, such as add a name, add a comment. So for this example, I will name this marker apply blur and I'll also add a comment blur this area. Click OK. Now you can see the marker here on the clip and if you hover the mouse over the marker you need to pause for a second or so for the tooltip to show up. You get to see the name of the marker. It reminds us that we will need to blur this area. Now remember this is a clip marker. The marker stays with the clip, whether I move the clip to another location on the timeline, like so, see, the marker shows up here. Open the clip in the source monitor, drag the clip over the source monitor. The clip marker is accessible here too, on the source monitor. By the way, if the marker does not show up here, then you'll need to enable show markers in the source monitor settings menu. To open the settings menu, Click on the wrench icon and enable Show Markers. And note that when I hover over the marker in the source monitor, we can see both the name and the description like we did on the timeline panel. So we looked at clip markers and we know that a clip marker is attached to a clip. Remember that in order to add a marker to a clip, you first select the clip then position the current time indicator to the location you want the marker to be set, and then hit M. We'll now look at another type of markers, the sequence markers. First, I'll move this clip back to its original location. Good. Now, make sure that no clips are selected. Click an empty space on the timeline. This deselects any clip. OK, let's assume again that you are busy working on your project. You are assembling clips of the sequence and you might want to add a transition effect here between these two clips in order to get a smoother transition between them. And again, you are not planning on doing this now. 
yet you just want to remember about this later in the editing process. So position the cursor somewhere here, close to the intersection of the clips you want to add the transition to. Now click M once, this adds a sequence marker. Notice that the marker is now attached to the sequence. It shows up here. A marker displayed here is a sequence marker, while our previous marker here on this clip was a clip marker. Now hit M again to open the marker dialog. And like we did for our clip marker, we are adding a name, type transition, and a description. Add a creative transition here. We can also set the duration of the marker to really represent the duration of the transition, for instance. So let's set it to about one second. I'll edit the duration field and set it to one second and click OK. The sequence marker now spawns that duration and clearly indicates that we we'll need to do something here. Hover over the marker, wait a second or so, and there you go. A tooltip gives us a hint on this marker. As your project grows, you will probably end up with several timeline markers and clip markers. The markers menu offers several options for working with markers. Let's add a few markers to better represent the real case scenario. I want another sequence marker here at the intersection of these two clips. Given that I want to add a sequence marker, I'll make sure that no clips are selected by clicking here. Then I'll place my cursor to this location because I do want to transition again here and hit M and M a second time. I'll just call this sequence marker transition 2 and I also want an additional clip marker on this clip. Select the clip, scrub here, hit M, then M again, and let's just name this clip marker desaturate, assuming we want to desaturate this area later on. Now navigate here and open the markers menu. The menu provides several options. You can use the menu to add markers, see the M shortcut here. That's what we just used to add markers. You can navigate through markers using the go to next or go to previous marker options or with the shortcuts shift M and control shift M or command shift M on the back. Let's navigate through our markers. Hit escape to leave the menu. Now I hit shift and M to go to the next marker or Ctrl Shift M to go to the previous marker. Notice that the next marker or the previous marker can either be a sequence marker or a clip marker. When I hit next or previous, we are walking through each marker type, whether it's a sequence marker or a clip marker. Okay, now we'll navigate back to the markers menu. Notice that we can also clear the selected marker or you can clear all markers. Clearing a marker is specific to the marker type. In other words, you'll have to give focus to the timeline panel in order to remove timeline markers, and you'll have to give focus to the source monitor panel in order to remove clip markers. Click the timeline panel. It has the focus now. Notice the blue outline here. Now, if I chose to clear all markers, then only the timeline markers will be removed. The clip markers will remain untouched. Let's try it then. Notice the sequence markers here and the clip markers there. Now with the timeline panel selected, go to markers, select clear all markers. See, the sequence markers are gone, but the clip markers are still there. Undo to restore the sequence markers we just deleted. We will now remove the clip markers. And to do so, we first need to give focus to the source monitor. So first, we need to make sure that the clip is opened in the source monitor. If it isn't open already, just drag the clip over here to the source monitor. Give focus to the source monitor. Click here and notice the blue highlight indicating the panel is having focus. The clip markers for this clip do show here. Select a marker, click this one for instance, and notice that the color of the marker changes to reflect the selection. Then navigate to the markers menu, 
and select clear selected marker. As expected, the previously selected marker is gone. Open the markers menu again and now select clear all markers. Note that the remaining clip markers are all gone, but the sequence markers are still there. That's because we have the source monitor panel selected. Let's undo a couple of times to restore the clip markers we just deleted. So let's quickly recap. When the source monitor has the focus, clearing markers clears clip markers but leaves sequence markers untouched. When the source monitor has the focus, adding a marker from the markers menu or simply by clicking M on the keyboard will add a marker to the clip at the position of the current time indicator. When the timeline panel has the focus, clearing markers removes sequence markers, leaving clip markers untouched. When the timeline panel has the focus and no clips are selected, hitting M to add a marker adds a sequence marker at the position of the current time indicator. And finally, when the timeline panel has the focus and a clip is selected, hitting M to add a marker adds a clip marker at the position of the current time indicator. Easy enough, right? Premiere also provides a markers panel. The panel becomes convenient when you are working with several clip markers and several sequence markers. You'll find the panel markers either along the panel group here or in the overflow menu. If it does not show up here, then select the window menu, click on markers, and this opens the markers panel. When no clips are selected on the timeline, the markers panel displays the sequence markers. Unselect any clip by clicking on an empty area on the timeline, and we now see here the two sequence markers we created previously. When a clip is selected, the markers panel displays the clip markers. Bikers on Street has two markers here and here, so select the clip and notice that the markers associated to this clip now show in the markers panel. Select another clip that has no markers, say bikers and a car. The markers panel is empty since that clip has no markers. Drag bikers on street to the source panel and give focus to the source panel by clicking here. The clip has two markers and the markers panel shows both markers. Notice now that I select a marker on the marker panel the current time indicator jumps to the markers position. Markers can be edited from the markers panel. Click near the name field of each marker to give it a name. Click on this field to edit the description of the marker. The markers we see here are clip markers because the source monitor panel has focus and the clip displayed in the source panel contains markers. Switch focus back to the timeline panel Click the empty area here to make sure that no clip is selected. The markers panel now show the sequence markers. You can see them here on the timeline. And we can change the out point of the second marker from the panel markers to define the length of the transition that we want to add uh, later here. So clip markers and sequence markers can be used to leave notes or comments and to remember about doing something later on during the editing process. Enough already with tracks. Enough already with markers. I'd like now to show you when to render portions of clips in order to ensure quality real-time preview of your work. Check the yellow horizontal line here. Occasionally that line or a portion of it can turn red or green. A yellow line indicates that Premiere will need to do some rendering in order to give us real-time playback. Yellow tells us that Premiere should be able to calculate things quickly enough in order to render our preview in real-time. Real-time playback is what we see here in the program monitor when we hit play. With a yellow bar, Premiere will probably not drop any frame while giving us real-time playback, 
and what we would see here is a good representation of the actual final rendering. So yellow is good. A red line indicates that Premiere may not be able to give us real-time playback without dropping frames. This can happen when an effect is applied to a clip and requires heavy computing. Premiere will do its best to display real-time, but might have to drop frames in order to keep up with a real-time preview. Thus, the preview here in the program monitor may not be an exact representation of the final rendering. We can turn on a visual clue that will tell us whether any frames are dropped during playback. And that clue is the Show Dropped Frame Indicator. We will need to enable it. Open the Settings menu, click the wrench icon here, and select Show Dropped Frame Indicator. See, a little circle now shows up here. The color of the circle can change, and the color tells us whether or not frames get dropped during playback. When the circle is green, Premiere tells us that it does not have to drop frames in order to produce real-time playback. When I run this clip, for instance, the circle stays green. When the circle is yellow, Premiere tells us that it has to drop frames in order to provide real-time preview. That also means that Premiere may not show a true representation of the final output. When an effect or a series of effects are applied to a clip, then the rendering of the clip can be more complex and Premiere will need some CPU in order to render the clip and its effects. Let's see this in action. I applied two effects to this clip, but those effects are turned off currently. So we will turn them on in order to increase the rendering complexity of the clip and demonstrate this case. Open the Effect Controls panel. If the panel doesn't show in the group here, then navigate to the Window menu and enable Effect Controls. And from the Effect Controls panel, enable both the Mirror effect and the VR Glow effect by clicking on these two little FX icons here. Notice that the render bar turned red. This clip is now more complex to render. Now set the playhead a few seconds before the red section and hit play. Notice that as I get into the red section during playback, the indicator here turns from green to yellow. This indicates that frames are dropped and if I mouse over the indicator, Premiere tells me the number of frames it has dropped. It's important to know that this impacts in no way the final rendering of our project. This only affects the real-time preview, and this might be totally fine. But if we want an accurate representation of the effect applied to this clip, then we will need to render this clip or a portion of it. While rendering this clip, Premiere will create a temporary file and it will use that file when displaying the real-time preview. So let's select the portion we want to render. I will mark an in point slightly before the section marked in red. I place my playhead here and I hit I on the keyboard. Then move slightly after the end of the section and press O to mark an out point. To render this section, go to Sequence and select Render Effects In to Out, or just hit Enter on the keyboard. This renders the effect between the in and out points that we just selected. Premiere creates a render file, which is a video preview of this clip with the effects applied to this clip. Premiere will use that render file when running the video preview of this section. It will run real-time without dropping any frames since the section was pre-rendered. To render this section can take some time, and this depends on the effects applied to the section and the length of the section. I'll fast forward, so you won't have to wait for this job to finish. Alright, now that the rendering is complete, notice that the line has turned green. Green indicates that this section was rendered, and when I play back, the drop frame indicator stays green and it tells us that no frame is dropped during playback. In this tutorial, we looked at the timeline and the timeline options. We looked at shorted keys, 
you probably will want to use those shortcut keys to navigate efficiently through the sequence. We looked at tracks. I showed you how to display video thumbnails or clip names on each track and we learned how to add and remove tracks. We looked at timeline options, how to and when to turn a video track or an audio track on or off. We looked at markers, clip markers and sequence markers. Both will add a visual reference to an object at a specific point in time and can be used as reminders. Finally, we covered the colored render bars, yellow, red, and green. A yellow bar indicates a section that probably does not need to be rendered to play back in real time. A red bar indicates a section that probably must be rendered to play back in real time. And a green bar indicates a section that already has rendered preview files associated with it. In the next tutorial, we will focus on undo redo actions and the history panel. With the history panel, I'd show you how to jump to any state of the project created during the current working session.